First off, I want to uh, talk about um, the importance of not becoming overly concerned that you're developing dementia every time you might forget something. This happens all the time to all of us. Um, usually we forget about one thing a, a day if you are obsessive and carry a book around with yourself and make notes about how often you might forget or not forget things. So it does occur commonly. Now as we get older, there are some changes in our thinking. Usually um, they're mild and um, not a major inconvenience. Um, when it becomes more serious, that's when we uh, become concerned or worried about a dementia. Now some things improve as we get older. We have more experience, hopefully more wisdom. Uh, things like our vocabulary tends to be better as compared to when we're younger. But typically as we get older, and there's a lot of variability, some people show no change, some show maybe more um, pronounced change, there's, there's a mild decline in our memory. And, and the memory problem we tend to get with normal aging, just as we get older, is pro problems with retrieving memories. We, we know it's there. It's the tip of our tongue, it just doesn't come to us. And then people will give a hint or a cue and it will come flooding back to us. I'm sure you've all had that where someone's talking about something, not really sure what they're referring to, but then they'll mention some detail about the event and it'll come flooding back to you very quickly. And that's, that's normal. Um, we do have um, more trouble focusing our attention as we get older. Um, when I was a university student, there could be a party going on in the dorm and I could stay in my room and, and study, which is all I ever did at university. Uh, but it, it wouldn't bother me so much. But now if I go to a library and someone is talking 200 yards away, it does bother me. And I have a little bit less ability to focus my attention as compared to when I was younger. I'm more distractible. Generally, we're not as fast if we have to do kind of a speed test uh, when we get older. So if you have to do a 300 um, item multiple choice examination, do it when you're 18, not when you're 81. <laughs> and if we have challenges where you have to take in a lot of new information, analyze it in novel ways, it does tend to be, in general, a little bit more difficult as we get older. But these things are, are uh, issues that we can deal with. It's not a major problem. Um, but when does it become more of a concern? Well, there's a variety of ways to identify individuals where it might be more of an issue. This is just one. It's a questionnaire called the AD8. Alzheimer's disease and 8 is for the 8 questions you'd ask. And you'd ask about changes um, over the last several years caused by thinking problems in these following areas. Like difficulties with judgment, less interest in hobbies and activities, being quite repetitive, trouble learning how to use new things, new devices, um, forgetting the month or the year, not, not the date, but more the year and the month, um, having more trouble dealing with comp more complicated financial uh, matters, uh, trouble remembering appointments, and daily trouble with thinking and memory. So if, if you respond yes to two or more of those areas, that would suggest there might be something going on and that would entail maybe a visit to your physician or other practitioner to find out if there's something of more concern. Um, now there is a condition short of dementia called mild cognitive impairment. Uh, another term for it now is mild neurocognitive disorder. Um, and the, the, the terminology, mild neurocognitive disorder, comes from uh, a book of diagnosis uh, that physicians use called the DSM-5. This 5 because it's the fifth version of it. Um, and it's this boundary area between normality and the development of a mild dementia. So the person would have a complaint or concern about their thinking, usually their memory, and on testing, they would have trouble. And a, a test you might do, for example, is read a paragraph to a person and then ask what do they remember of the paragraph right after you read it and 20 or 30 minutes afterwards. And you'd know how much you'd expect people to be able to remember that paragraph. And if they score low, if they don't remember as much as you think, you'd be concerned that they do have a problem. But in people with mild cognitive impairment, they have preserved general thinking and they're still independent. Though it may take more effort for them to do more complicated things in their lives, like not so much trouble driving to places they know well, but it's more of a challenge if they're driving to places they don't know well. 
not really a problem day-to-day -day financial management, but more of a problem when they do their tax returns. And, and these were capabilities or areas that they formerly were able to manage quite well. Now, um, not all the individuals with mild cognitive impairment will get worse or progress, but there is a higher risk than people who have no um, cognitive issues, don't meet these criteria for mild cognitive impairment, uh, to progress. So as a rule of thumb, uh, maybe in the order of uh, one, one and a half, uh, uh, individuals out of 10 will progress over a year to the dementia stage, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, if you do have mild cognitive impairment, what would you do? Well, obviously, you'd search for the cause. Sometimes it's related to a depression. Sometimes it's related to uh, a bad effect or a reaction to a medication you might be on, and you might uh, find the cause and eliminate that cause and eliminate the problem. It's also a good time to look at advanced planning, and we'll talk more about that later on, but things like a, a personal directive, during power of attorney, updated will, uh, your goals of care, good time if you have that to consider doing it. Um, for prevention uh, of progression and improve your chances of not progressing, what would you do? Well, you should follow a healthy lifestyle. You know, things your mother told you to do, a number of years ago, like eat well, exercise, get your sleep, avoid stress, uh, don't drink too much, don't smoke. Um, and you would monitor that person for change over time because they are at a higher risk of progression. And in the future, when we have uh, interventions that might be able to modify that course that we know truly work, they would be a group, a target group for those interventions. And the interventions might be um, a healthy lifestyle, and maybe a life coach about how to be more physically active and follow a healthier diet. Could be medication, we don't know at present time. This is an area of a lot of research and uh, development as the years go by. Now, what is a dementia? Now, the, I should also mention, you wouldn't be surprised to know that there's a new term for dementia and is sometimes called major neurocognitive disorder. You can see like mild neurocognitive disorder is a milder problem, major is a more significant or serious problems. So you have an acquired problem in your thinking. So you're uh, doing very well, no big issues, and there's been a change. And it usually includes memory, but some other aspect of your thinking, such as making decisions or your language, your speech. And it's severe enough to interfere uh, with your ability to live independently or carry on at work. It has an impact on your life. And it can't be better explained by something else like a depression or an acute confusion, delirium. All of us might get an acute confusion or delirium if, for example, we develop a pneumonia, a lung infection, and we're admitted to hospital. It can be a very confusing event, particularly as we get older. So it wouldn't be explained by that. So that would be a dementia. So a, Mild, there's a problem, but it's not really impacting your life. For dementia, there's an impact in your life. Now, causes of dementia and also causes of mild cognitive impairment are many. There are many potential causes, uh, and they can occur alone or in combinations with each other. Now, the commonest causes of dementia as we get older would be, number one would be Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and after that would probably be combinations of Alzheimer's and another condition, Alzheimer's plus a vascular dementia or damage from strokes um, or maybe a Lewy body dementia that we'll talk about in a couple minutes. Then you'd have dementia with Lewy bodies and a vascular dementia, that's a dementia or thinking problems because of circulation problems. And then a frontal temporal dementia. Now rare causes, I just listed some of them here. Um, things you sometimes hear about now is CTE, that's chronic traumatic encephalopathy. You know, those are athletes in contact sports like football and boxing uh, where they have repetitive uh, injuries to their head because of the contact to their head and uh, playing their sport. They might uh, develop this chronic traumatic encephalopathy. You can develop a dementia if you uh, drink too much alcohol over a number of years. Um, there's a rare cause of dementia called creutzfeldt jakob disease, and there was a concern a number of decades ago that there was going to be an epidemic of this because of uh, the mad cow disease in the United Kingdom. You might remember a bit of that. Fortunately, it never uh, transpired, never came to, uh, to pass. But there are a lot of other potential causes. 
Now, what, what's sort of the hallmarks of the commoner causes? Well, Alzheimer's is the most common cause, and usually with Alzheimer's, the, the first and the most prominent symptom or manifestation would be difficulty with your memory. Um, and it's your recent memory, not your remote memory. You can remember your high school teacher, you can remember where you lived as a child, but you'll have trouble remembering what happened yesterday or earlier that day you talked to the person. So recent memory. Now with Lewy body dementia, uh, it's another form of dementia, uh, these individuals uh, often early on have very detailed visual hallucinations. They see usually people or animals uh, typically, they don't talk, uh, don't, are mute, but they're very detailed. They can describe what they look like. Um, I remember one lady uh, that I saw who unfortunately had Lewy body dementia thought she saw uh, midgets on top of roofs doing acrobatics and she'd become very concerned that they would fall off and injure themselves. Weren't there, but it was very detailed, very real to her. Um, also with Lewy body uh, dementia, people vary a lot from day to day, more than the variability we all have. We have good days and bad days, but a very marked variability. Um, and some days they seem very drowsy and not wooded. Out of the days they seem quite sharp. Um, they have some features that look a bit like Parkinson's disease, like they don't have the tremor, but they have more of that flex, bent forward posture and are slow in their movements. Um, and they can also have sleep problems. Normally when we dream, when we sleep, we can't move, we're paralyzed. But what uh, Louis Body mentioned, they have a sleep disorder where they can act out their dreams. So they often thrash around or talk in their sleep. And sometimes it's um, so severe, their bed partner has to leave because they can't sleep in the same bed or even the same room as a person. Now with a vascular dementia, there's evidence that the person's had strokes uh, either by the, the story they tell you or by your examination or by imaging of their brain. Sometimes people can have a vascular dementia and they don't have a history of strokes, but you'd see evidence of stroke-like damage, vascular damage, circulation damage on the imaging studies that you could do. And in frontal temporal dementia, there are two kind of general types. And one, the problem presents or starts with language difficulties. Uh, the person will have trouble uh, coming up with words or speaking in a fluent way, fluent manner. Sometimes we'll uh, forget how to use words. And you'll ask the person, well, what's a banana? And they'll say, banana, what's a banana? You know, common words, things they should know. Uh, and you sometimes wonder, maybe they've had a stroke infecting their speech area. But imaging studies show no stroke damage, but might show shrinkage and decrease activity in that section, that part of the brain. Now the other type of frontal temporal dementia, they present more with behavior problems. So the person will lose um, their social awareness, they might do embarrassing things, they don't show empathy to, to individuals. Um, and um, a question you might ask a person is that, does your mother, your father, your uncle, your aunt do, do things in public that are embarrassing and totally out of keeping uh, for them? And one individual I saw with a frontal temporal dementia a number of years ago uh, was a former high school principal, um, you know, very distinguished member of his community. Um, but when I um, saw him, he would do very bizarre things. Like when I examined him and asked him to walk around the room to see what his walking was like, he goose-stepped around like a Nazi soldier. Like he would never do this. And when I asked uh, to listen to his heart, I, and I put my stethoscope on his chest, he uh, picked up the stethoscope and started barking in the stethoscope like a dog. Very bizarre, very unusual, would never have done that, totally out of keeping with that person and the way they lived their life. So that's the two varieties of frontal temporal dementia, and if there's questions, we can talk a bit more about it. I should mention that frontal temporal dementia often occurs earlier in life, more in your 50s or early 60s, as compared to your 70s and 80s, which is more typical for Alzheimer's disease. And you can imagine how difficult that is in families, because people are still at work, they're still you know, making money to build up their nest egg for retirement, their children at home, often in high school, and you can imagine how difficult that might well be. Now, what's the progression? Well, it's hard to give you uh, any precise information because it depends a lot on the person, their general health, uh, the type of dementia they might have, 
and other factors that we don't fully understand. But if you just take Alzheimer's, and these are just kind of general figures, um, it does tend uh, to worsen over time, though the rate varies from person to person. It may not be at a const constant pace all the way through the course of the illness. There might be periods of time where it seems to be quite indolent, not change much, and periods where it seems to be uh, accelerating, it seems to be a more prominent or more quick change. But from the time of diagnosis until the person passes away, often we're talking about the range of four to eight years. And the time of diagnosis is, is only here in the mild stage, and I'll explain that in a couple of minutes. Um, but people can live up to 20 years, if not longer, with Alzheimer's disease, depending on all these other factors. Um, now, when we think of Alzheimer's, and remember I'm just talking about Alzheimer's right now, there is a, a preclinical stage where now it's becoming evident that there are changes going on in the brain, uh, Alzheimer's changes, deposition of this amyloid protein, these tau proteins, things that really shouldn't be there, that will go on for years, if not decades, before the onset of any clinical symptoms or signs. And the brain is working around these problems and rewiring itself and coping with it. And then um, you start developing mild problems, this mild cognitive impairment stage, where there's difficulties on testing, but the person still lives independently, still managing on their own. And here, this is the mild dementia stage. This is where people start having functional problems. And that's usually when the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, dementia, is made. And the functional problems early on tend to be in more complicated things in life, like financial management, medication management, driving a car. And then in the moderate stage, what tends to be the longest period of this four to eight years, the symptoms become more evident and more of an impact on the person. And, and um, often in this stage, the question comes up as to whether um, the person requires a move into uh, supportive living or long-term care for care. And then the last stage is severe advanced dementia. And the person is in need here of 24-hour care. And interacts less and less with their world. And um, um, you, you probably know that, um, unfortunately, dementia is a, a, is a growing cause of death in our society. It's being recognized more and more as a cause of death. More people die with dementia than die from dementia. About a, you know, a quarter to a third of people die with a dementia, but they will die from maybe heart disease or cancer or some other cause. A smaller number, but still a significant number, will be dying from their dementia. And usually what happens is that uh, you uh, start losing weight, become malnourished, become more predisposed to infections, might have swelling problems, and the last event often will be an infection, you know, a pneumonia, and that will be tip you over the, uh, the edge and uh, lead to your death. In the United Kingdom, dementia is now the most common cause of death, single cause of death, uh, because it's a condition which is linked to age, and as we get older, we're more likely to develop this condition, and rates for deaths from things like heart disease are going down, but that hasn't happened yet with a dementia. Now, how is it diagnosed? Well, uh, you would see your, your primary care practitioner, usually a family doctor, but it could be another practitioner, and they would evaluate you if there was a suspicion, like maybe based on a positive response to two or more of the questions I mentioned in the AD8. So the, a history, a story would be obtained from the person themselves. You would ask about their thinking, their function, their behavior, general health questions, use of medications, use of alcohol. You'd also like to talk to a family member or someone who knows them well, because unfortunately the person uh, with the condition may not be fully aware of some of the functional and behavioral problems, and you'd, have, you'd want to talk to someone else. And also they may forget some of the details that would be important to hear about. So you'd like to talk to someone else who knows them well. And then there would be a physical examination. You'd be looking for signs, for example, like Lewy body dementia, these signs of Parkinson's uh, disease or like Parkinson's. If you're worried about a vascular dementia, you'd be looking for signs of stroke damage, you know, and maybe a person would be weak in one half of their body. And then there would be some cognitive or thinking test and a screen for depression because you'd want to rule out depression. Often <coughs> people who have cognitive problems and depression 
they, it's more likely they have both rather than one or the other. But dealing with the depression can improve things quite a bit, improve the person's quality of life. So it's important to look for that. Then be some laboratory tests done, and many people will go on and have brain imaging. Could be a, a what's called a CAT or a CT scan or an MRI. Um, MRI is a little bit more sensitive, and you can look for more things. But there's a long wait period to have an MRI done in um, our city. You know, if it's done through the public system, though, you know, if you go private, you can get it done. Uh, very quickly. But the CT scan or CAT scan will give you really all the information you truly require. So it's not a, uh, an absolute necessity. Oops. Okay. Okay, there we go. So what, are, what about causes and prevention? Now, now clearly we'd hope dementia never occurs and I think the real hope in the future is that we can prevent this condition. And I think that's going to be more effective than treating it after it becomes evident, but because by then, uh, the brain has been dealing with this damage for years. So it's already um, damaged, and it's, it's gonna be difficult to recoup or recover fully from that damage. So we like to prevent it, prevent the damage from ever occurring. It, it does appear that if we deal with what's called vascular risk factors, factors that would increase your risk of a heart attack or a stroke, we might also be able to reduce the risk of uh, dementia by maybe up to 20% over 20 years. Like, that, that's quite a bit. That's one out of five individuals who would be otherwise fated to develop a dementia. So you look at uh, smoking and your diet, your physical activity level, blood pressure, cholesterol level, your weight, and your, whether you have diabetes and deal with these issues. And it might prevent cases of dementia. It might also slow down the progression and lead to fewer people at a severe stage of dementia. You could possibly add to this even more by looking at protective factors like stimulating our brain. It's been long known that people who have more education are less likely to develop a dementia. And the theory is that the stimulation of um, going to school, high school, university uh, are good for you. Though I must admit I'm not sure going to high school was always that stimulating, but <laughs> it is what it is. But, but if you have a more stimulating life, if, if you're more active, if you, if you socialize more, if you uh, read more, if you go to museums and art galleries and do more things of that nature, if you're more engaged socially uh, with your community, with your family, and if you have good sleep habits, um, those are protective factors. And what you want to do is minimize other risky ones like traumatic brain injury that we talked about already, excessive alcohol intake or substance use, abuse, um, Avoiding depression or dealing with depression that occurs, trying to minimize stress. And that's what's called neuroticism. That's the tendency of some people to respond very negatively to anything bad going on in their lives, to, to threats or frustrations or losses. An interesting one is poor hearing. Um, people who have hearing problems are more likely to develop a dementia. The cause of that is not clear. And it's also not clear whether you correct hearing loss would prevent dementia or not. That's a, an important question that will have to be answered over the coming years. But um, if you could also do this, it might even add more to this 20% figure. So it would be important to look at. And there's already some um, good news that I'll talk about in the next slide. But, but because of the aging of uh, Canadian society, it is expected that there will be more people suffering from dementia over the coming decades. So in 2016, um, between 500 and 600,000 persons living in Canada were felt to have a dementia. That was the best estimate. And because of the aging of our society in 15 years, that number is going to go up to a little bit less than a million. Um, so there's going to be more people dealing with dementia. And as a society, we'll have to gear up to deal with that increasing number of individuals in need of help. But as I mentioned, there is some promising news. A recent study suggests that in high-income countries like Canada, United States and Europe, Japan, the risk of dementia at specific, age may, at specific ages may have declined over the last 25 years. So what I'll try to explain is that there's more older people, but if you look at older individuals per 100, the, the number of people with dementia, that number is going down. So a national study done in the States looked at rates in 2000 and rates in 2012. And they found just over those 12 years, the likelihood of dementia decreased from 
about 12% among those 65 and over to about 9%. Uh, so that's a 24% decline. So that's quite good. Why that's happening is not entirely clear. It might be because of better education. So just in those 12 years, on average, people had one more year of education. So that might have had an impact. And also possibly better treatment of heart disease and vascular risk factors. But we don't fully understand what's going on. Clearly, we hope that trend continues. And we would like to do whatever we can to abet or reinforce that trend. So the number of people dealing with this condition will go down. Now, the care of people with dementia is complex. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, as their needs will change over time, and also you have to support their caregiver. Most people with dementia have a primary caregiver who's supporting the individual. And they are often what we call the hidden patient. Most of the things you do for dementia are not drug, not drug related. And it's important to emphasize that because usually at forums like this, people say, well, what drugs should we use? What medication could we try? It's important to emphasize that most of the things that we can do which are important, which are effective, are not related to medications. I will talk about medications in a few minutes. Um, so what would you do? Well, first off, inform the person with dementia and their family of the diagnosis and answer questions they may have about that diagnosis. You identify if there's a caregiver and how they're doing and what they might be able to do to help that, uh, their family member, usually family member. You look at the person's safety. You encourage them to look at advanced planning. You assess their decision-making abilities. You refer them to a local Alzheimer's Society uh, branch or uh, Alzheimer's Society itself and provide information of treatment options, both drug and non-drug. Then you agree on a plan with the person living with dementia and their family, and that's updated as needed as time goes on. Many of these things are updated as time goes on, like the safety issues. And then you follow the person over time, you monitor the response to the interventions you might mobilize, and you mobilize resources as needed, like community-based programs and maybe facility-based programs down the road. Now drug treatment, the available drug treatments, for the commoner types of dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, uh, are only modestly effective at the present time and don't work for everyone. The drugs most commonly used are drugs called cholinesterase inhibitors, and they're drugs like denipazil, rivastigmine, or galanthamine. Um, they're approved now for mild, moderate, and for denipazil, severe stages of the illness. They're also approved uh, in Canada for use of uh, dementia associated with Parkinson's disease. Now, the benefits are modest, but can be seen by the person living with dementia and their family members, and can be beneficial and would be a consideration uh, for people with um, Alzheimer's disease and maybe Parkinson's uh, disease dementia. Um, you would try the medication, you'd monitor the response, and you'd continue monitoring, and at a certain point, it may become um, evident that it's not worthwhile carrying on, and you stop the medication. Um, you'd also make sure the person would not be at any undue risk if using these medications. So it's not for everyone. There would have to be an assessment and then follow up afterwards if, it's, uh, if they're prescribed. Um, unfortunately, recent trials of new drugs have been, by and large, very disappointing, but they're still ongoing. There's still an active search for new treatments, new medications for um, Alzheimer's disease and the other commoner types of uh, dementia. Why they don't work is maybe treatment has started too late. As I mentioned, these changes in the brain have been going on for a long time before the symptoms become evident. It also is probably because we don't fully understand the causes of the causes in a particular individual. And it's also a complex disease where one drug in its own may not be enough. As you know, in cancer treatment, often people are on a combination of medications. And we may have to look at combinations of treatment for conditions like Alzheimer's disease. I should mention here that if someone has a vascular dementia, a lot of your focus would be on trying to prevent further stroke damage, you know, by dealing with high blood pressure or diabetes they might have or elevated cholesterol and maybe the use of a, you know, a drug like an aspirin a day, try to prevent further stroke damage. Um, now, if you do have dementia, how can you live well with it? That's really an aspiration. And this is a, a quote I took from the um, document in the United Kingdom uh, uh, describing their national dementia strategy in the United Kingdom and England, particularly. 
And the aim is that all people with dementia in their care should live well with dementia. It, it goes on and it notes that it's a devastating uh, set of illnesses, dementia, has a profound negative effect, but there's a lot of things that we can do to improve the situation for them and maintain their quality of life. Um, now factors affecting the person's ability to live as well as possible with dementia would include their assets and resources, like uh, how much social contact they might have, the quality of their relationships with family and others, and the help and support they can obtain from families and others. Um, their housing, their economic status, their physical health and their psychological health, you know, their self-esteem, their optimism, these are all factors which will influence your ability to live well with this condition. And also then access and use of services uh, that are appropriate for the individual. The challenges, of course, would be the severity of dementia, which tends to get worse as time goes on, and the particular symptoms you might experience. And also how we adapt, you know, how we manage and cope with the challenges dementia brings. We all vary in our ability to cope with challenges in our lives, and this is clearly another challenge. And the question is how well we can deal with that. From studies, it appears that um, characteristics or factors which are helpful in dealing with dementia for people with dementia would include uh, the ability to still engage in life, um, look for pleasure and enjoyment in your life, keep going, and um, profit from the love and support of those around you. Um, it's also important to face and fight uh, dementia and deal with it with humor and hope. Um, and also, even though you have a dementia, still give thanks for being here and still realize that you're still you, you're still me. Some of you may have seen the movie Still Alice, it was out a number of years ago, with Gordon Pinson and um, Julie Christie, I think it was. Um, and then you can still grow and you can still transcend this problem. It's not you, it's a problem you are facing. Um, another um, approach is trying to foster dementia-friendly <coughs> communities. And that's how people with dementia feel included and supported in the places they work, live and play. It began in Japan and the United Kingdom. It's now spread to North America and there's a dementia-friendly initiative here in Calgary. And it focuses on decreasing the stigma of having dementia. And by the way, the stigma of dementia affects a person living with dementia, but also their carers, their families, and, and those uh, dealing with them. Um, and you also want to include uh, people with dementia in their community. So the general public would be educated about dementia, know that a person with dementia can sometimes experience the world somewhat differently and help them. Uh, and then people living with dementia feel supported by their community wherever they might be. And community can be defined broadly. It could mean a location like your neighborhood, but it could also include groups of people with shared interests or features, for example, like a leisure uh, club. They could have a dementia-friendly approach and make um, the leisure center hospitable uh, to people suffering from a dementia. Now, I I'm gonna go through some examples of questions and then we'll open up and have questions from the audience. Um, and I just want to make a couple of qualifications. Um, my responses, particularly to those questions which will come up later, represent my opinion and uh, uh, I'm hardly omniscient, omniscient and I, uh, there are things I don't know and uh, people can clearly disagree with my opinion on certain matters. So please keep that in mind. Um, and I'll be providing a general response but not a specific response. And as been pointed out by Margaret Atwood, context of all the details are so important. Um, but um, please keep that in mind, there can be general responses in my opinion. Um, one question came up in uh, a prior forum was, do drugs cause dementia? Um, that's a difficult question to answer because if you find um, a higher rate of dementia with people who are on a particular medication, it could still be occurring just by chance. It might be explained by the reason the person is taking that particular medication. For example, if you find that taking a medication for depression seems to be associated with increased risk, it might be because the medication is being prescribed for depression, and depression is the early feature of a dementia. Um, so that's, that can be a difficult thing to pull apart. Or clearly it could be the drug. Um, now, 
doesn't, dr drugs don't usually cause a dementia, but they would increase your risk of dementia, but it's likely uh, contributing to that whole constellation of factors which lead to dementia declaring itself in that person. Now, most people develop dementia because of their makeup or their genes. I don't know if any of you have ever done um, those genetic testings you can get, like get 23andMe or Ancestry.com, and you send it off, and you know, and, and I know at least for the 23andMe, they send you back um, information if you're interested about whether you have a genetic risk factor for developing Alzheimer's. It doesn't mean you're going to get it, but it might increase your risk somewhat. Um, but it's usually your genes, your makeup, things you've been exposed to during your life, and your age and time, because dementia is a condition which gets more common as we get older. So for most people, it's sort of a mix of all those three factors. Now, the drugs which have been attracting the most interest as a contributor to the development of dementia would be um, anticholinergics and sedatives. Uh, sedatives are the easiest one to explain. Those are like sleep medications or anti-anxiety medications. Um, and it does appear that people who take these medications might be at an increased risk of developing a dementia. It doesn't mean everyone will, uh, and um, you have to factor in all the other risk factors a person might have. Um, and it just kind of makes the point that we should be careful in any medication anything we take within our body about do we really need this, on balances it in our best interest. Anticholinergics uh, include some of the older antidepressants and also some of the medications which are used to deal with stomach problems and bladder problems. Um, and um, if you want to know if a medication is anticholinergic, you probably should be uh, asking uh, your health care provider and they should be able to provide that information uh, to you. Um, and it seems that use of these medications might increase the risk. Doesn't mean it will, but might increase the risk of developing a dementia. And so that's why it's very important on balance just to determine whether the drug is more beneficial than more, more harmful or potentially harmful. Um, Down syndrome and dementia. Uh, Down syndrome is a common cause of a developmental handicap. And um, people with Down syndrome are at greater risk of developing the changes of Alzheimer's in the brain in their 40s and 50s and develop a superimposed dementia on top of their developmental handicap. Um, the explanation, the most common explanation is that in people who have Down syndrome, they have three copies of a chromosome called chromosome 21. And the, the gene that um, leads to the formation of amyloid protein is on 21. So you end up with more of that chromosome and more production over the years of probably this amyloid protein. At least that's the best guess about what's going on. Um, traumatic brain injury. So if you have a moderate or severe traumatic brain injury, um, that does lead to a greater risk of developing Alzheimer's late in life in most studies. But there's no evidence a single mild traumatic brain injury would increase your dementia risk. So what I'm saying is that if you bump your head um, someday on a ceiling and see stars for a second, that doesn't mean you're at increased risk, okay? Uh, you know, I'm talking about uh, a significant injury where you're unconscious for a number of minutes, if not longer, where you're amnestic, remember nothing about the event for a period of time. That could increase your risk. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it would increase your risk. And there's emerging evidence about multiple mild traumatic brain injuries, such as with sport, boxing, football, hockey, may be linked to a greater risk uh, of a type of dementia called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Now, is Alzheimer's contagious? Uh, no, it, it's, you're, it's not transmissible. You're not gonna catch it by caring for someone with Alzheimer's. But there is work looking at whether viruses that we maybe have picked up as a child or uh, at adolescence or early in life that we carry in our body might incite changes in our brain that would lead to Alzheimer changes itself when in the brain, it might increase the risk. But it doesn't mean it's contagious. You see um, evidence or reports now and then in the newspapers about herpes simplex or cold sore viruses leading to increased risk of dementia. It doesn't mean it's contagious, but it, just like certain medications might increase the risk, 
if you've been exposed to certain viruses, certain infections earlier in life, it might increase your risk. Not the sole cause, but might increase your risk. Uh, is it hereditary? Well, in a small percentage of people with Alzheimer's, uh, less than 5%, there is a mutation in a gene. And if you have that mutation, that change, you will develop Alzheimer's disease by a certain age, if you live to that age. Uh, but of more interest for more people are these uh, genetic risk factors that will increase your susceptibility or likelihood of developing Alzheimer's. Um, another question that came up, another one was, does multiple sclerosis lead to dementia? Well, people with MS, and I wrote down here, can develop changes in their thinking, but usually it's not of the uh, pattern or severity that would be enough to diagnose a dementia. Um, some people refer to Alzheimer's disease as type 3 diabetes. Um, type 1 is, you know, uh, juvenile onset diabetes where you don't produce insulin. Type 2 is where you're resistant to insulin. You make insulin, but uh, you're resistant to it. Um, type 3 diabetes, researchers are talking about maybe within the brain, um, there's a form of diabetes that affects the brain. Um, and it has features which overlap with type 1 and type 2. We do know that type 2 diabetes would increase your risk of developing Alzheimer's, but as a risk factor, not as a sole cause. There is some evidence that the brain's ability to use and metabolize uh, sugar, glucose, is affected and not as good in Alzheimer's disease. And that there have been studies looking at diabetic medications as a potential treatment for Alzheimer's disease, but they're still ongoing, no proof at the present time. So something to keep, uh, keep track of. Uh, sleep and Alzheimer's. It, it seems like poor sleep might be bad for your brain and increase your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but also people with Alzheimer's disease tend to sleep not as well as people without Alzheimer's and spend more time awake at night. So often it's hard to know what's cart and horse here. Some, it's probably going both ways. The theory about why would poor sleep increase your risk of Alzheimer's is that while we're sleeping in the deep sleep, we're kind of flushing our brain out of all the proteins and toxins that we produced in the course of a day and get, clean out the brain. And if we don't sleep deeply enough at night, we're not really flushing the system as well as we should. And things tend to build up. At least that's the theory at the present time. Um, I mentioned that when you have Alzheimer's, you have this uh, accumulation of amyloid protein and another protein called tau. Could you have this increased amount of amyloid in your brain uh, and not have a dementia? And the answer is yes. Um, it, it, you know, you can't have Alzheimer's unless you have increased amounts of these proteins. But it, the proteins are also seen in the brains of people who have no cognitive problems. If, if you look at older individuals who died from a, another cause and examine their brain, up to a quarter of them will have increased amounts of amyloid protein in their brain. And it may be that it's just not enough to cause problems. It may be that uh, with time problems would occur, but just not quite yet. Uh, or it may be that some of us are just better at working around these problems, rewiring our brain so it's not um, as likely to affect our thinking as much as other people. Um, so how would you look for an earlier diagnosis of Alzheimer's? I, I think you'd follow the approach I outlined. Um, you could look in certain families for these rare mutations, but you'd have to look only in specific individuals. These, these would be families where half of every generation develop a dementia at an early age. You know, it's, it's not a typical history that you would hear, but you'd ask for it, and if they're interested, you could look at genetic testing uh, for these rare causes of um, Alzheimer's due to genetic uh, mutation. Um, there are um, emerging tests now that can look for how much amyloid and tau even uh, you have in your brain, but they're, they're still very much in the research arena. Um, part of the problem is that many of us, probably even uh, myself, will probably have increased amounts of amyloid in my brain as compared to a younger individual. And what we don't know is what that really means. What, what is your risk of progressing to a problem? And what can we do about it? Not clear what we should do if anything. So it's still early, 
Maybe in five years, ten years, it'll be clearer what we should be doing. Um, so I'm, I'm not advocating that you go and have a spinal tap to look for these proteins or a brain scan to look for uh, amyloid in your brain, though they can be done at this time. And we could talk about that if there's a question. So uh, care questions, should you tell the person who has the, that, the, with the Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia that they have disease? The general answer is yes, if they, if they want to know. Sometimes people say, don't tell me. Uh, and that's her right, but uh, I think sometimes you're better off um, wrestling with the devil you know than fearing the devil you don't. And it allows people to think about um, their future, uh, future plans. It also uh, allows them to consider their treatment options. It's hard to justify treating people for Alzheimer's if you don't tell them they have that condition. So should be told in general. Um, I think how should family members handle talking about diagnosed dementia? I think you acknowledge it when it comes up, but don't insist the person accepts it and in a way kind of come back over and over and over again. You don't lie about it, but you don't insist that the person accepts it. Um, another question is that once an individual receives a diagnosis, who's the best caregiver? Well, it depends. There's so many variables involved here. Um, usually it's a close family member, uh, whether it's a spouse or a partner or a child. It, it depends on quality of relationships, the ability of the person to deal uh, with the person's living with dementia and their needs. So a very complex question, and there's no simple answer to that one. Um, when would a person with dementia need to move into facility? Again, a very difficult, complex question. And it's a balance between their needs and types of problems encountered and available resources. And to move into supportive living or long-term care in Alberta, you have to cross a certain threshold of need. Um, you don't go in to long-term care in a preventive way. It, you have to require that level of care before you'd move in. Are routines and general health for, for people with dementia? Yes. Uh, people tend to do better in, in predictable environments as compared to dealing with a lot of things coming from left field. Now behavioral issues. Um, a lot of terms for behavioral problems which might arise with dementia. Sometimes they're called behavioral expressions. Sometimes they're called responsive behaviors. Uh, sometimes they're called behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia and sometimes they're called neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia. All those terms have their pluses and minuses. Um, response to behaviors um, is built on the premise that behavior is always has meaning and you have to understand what's driving the behavior. Uh, but not all problems with behavior you encounter um, in a dementia are solely related um, to, let's say, discord between the individual and a caregiver. Sometimes it's driven, unfortunately, by the condition itself. So it's hard to blame everything on responsive uh, behaviors or call them all response behaviors. Mm -hmm. They're common. 90% uh, of people with dementia at some point in the condition will develop some type of behavioral problem that might have to be dealt with. And uh, it is related to progressive deterioration of thinking, um, but you have, to, you have to think about the person, things that might lead you know, to the behavior, and the impact of your reaction. For example, if a behavior is a person is in a long-term care setting and they call out, and you might find out they only call out when they're left alone for a long period of time, and your reaction is that when they call out, you go in and see the person. You can see that um, your reaction, which is quite appropriate, would tend to reinforce that behavior because the person is getting what they want, they, they contact with a, another human being. So you might have to think it through and say, well, maybe we have to look, look at maybe putting pictures in, encouraging the family to visit more often, um, other things, maybe move the individual into an area where they can see other, other people so they feel less isolated, less alone. Um, some of the precipitants for problem behaviors could be things like unrecognized pain. Um, people who have a more advanced dementia might have trouble explaining what's troubling them. And if they're in uncontrolled pain, you can well imagine why that could drive agitation and anxiety. So sometimes you have to be uh, quite astute and, and kind of looking for evidence or signs of that. Um, some of the behavioral uh, issues that may occur, they don't always occur, are some of these ones listed here. And if you have questions about any of them um, during the Q&A, we can talk about them. One I want to talk about is denial. 
you know, sometimes uh, family members will tell me, well, um, my mother or my father deny they have a dementia. It may not be denial in the usual sense of the word. It may be more of a lack of awareness. Um, people with dementia may not be truly aware of the problems they're facing, um, you know, the functional limitations and the thinking problems. And that's called, if you want a fancy word, is anosnoxia. And rather than arguing with the person because they just don't see it, that's like a blind spot, you try to mitigate the effect with the person and, and, and insist that they accept the diagnosis because they just don't see it. It's a blind spot. Um, one question that came up, if an answer for some question is very upsetting, do you continue to tell the person the bad news when they have a severe memory problem and they keep forgetting? Now, an example of this was a story I heard about uh, um, um, a woman who was in a long-term care facility in the United States whose son was um, killed in military service in Afghanistan or Iraq, I'm not sure where. Um, and the family every day would go in and tell her that her son died. Every day. And every day was a devastating event. And uh, to me, there's no point. I mean, if it's important for her to know at that time, yes. But otherwise, I would try to just say, well, where's Fred? Say, well, Fred's away right now, and, and move on to another topic. But it seemed to me inflicting that pain every day seems that there's not a lot of kindness with your honesty. So I, I, would, I, I think you really have to um, think hard about questions of this nature. We don't want to lie to people, but on the other hand, you don't want to uh, inflict undue pain or suffering. If a person you uh, are visiting can't recall that you've been there regularly or with your last visit, do you argue with them and remind them they came up recently? No. You just move on to another topic.